Hi, good morning. Can you hear me okay? Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you for having us. Yes, we're here to talk about our favorite subject, diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> so we're really happy to be here. We thought we'd do this together. So uh, if anyone has any questions along the way, please feel free to interrupt and ask any questions that you have. Let's see. So we're going to start out with the objectives. So these are the things that we'd like to highlight during our talk. So the treatment and changes to the new C. diff treatment guidelines, the difference between moderate and severe C. diff, and the type uh, of patient to test for C. diff. So these are the things that we're going to try and highlight throughout the talk. Uh, C. diff, the impact and risk. So we're going to go through these things and uh, then go through them kind of again in a context of, of recent studies and recent articles that came out. So this is from the CDC. Uh, we'd also like to start out showing why it's important to talk about C. diff, so uh, uh, with the impact. So the cases, uh, about 500,000 cases to, um, uh, to C. diff uh, in one year, comes back at least one uh, in, in five patients who get C. diff. So it's, it's very important to identify the patients, uh, uh, put them in the correct precautions, and treat them correctly so it doesn't come back. It, it caused 15,000 deaths in one year. So for people over 65, one in 11 died in a healthcare-associated C. diff infection within a month of receiving a diagnosis of C. diff. <clears throat> and, and the risk. So people on antibiotics are seven to 10 times more likely to get C. diff uh, while on antibiotics and during the month after. So it's very important. I mean, antimicrobial stewardship can't stress enough uh, to give antibiotics correctly. Being in the healthcare setting, especially hospitals or nursing homes, is, is a risk in itself. So just being in, in healthcare facilities. More than 80% of C. diff uh, deaths occurred in people 65 and older. So age is another risk factor. And the spread. So as far as the spread goes, touching unclean surfaces, especially those in healthcare settings, contaminated with feces from an infected person. So you don't even need to touch the patient to uh, get it on your hands and be at risk. So dirty hands. And if you get it on your hands, uh, our facility, like a lot of facilities, they'll, they'll cover the, uh, uh, the hand gel. So it makes people aware that the hand gel won't work for C. diff. So it won't kill the spores. So you actually have to wash your hands, physically remove uh, the spores from your hands by, by washing it, physically removing it, and, uh, uh, because the hand gel won't work. Failing to notify other healthcare facilities when patients with C. diff transfer from one facility to another. So this is another important part of, of recognizing patients uh, with C. diff or at risk for C. diff and then when they get transferred, I, uh, telling the facility that they're going to, to uh, make them aware and put them in, in uh, isolation precautions. And then as far as prevention, uh, impose, uh, improve prescribing of antibiotics. Use best tests, so we'll talk about the tests to use when, when diagnosing C. diff. Rapidly identify and isolate patients with C. diff, wear gloves and gowns, and clean rooms and surfaces with EPA approved spore killing disinfectants such as bleach. So we'll talk about that also. Antibiotic use in hospitals and costs. So uh, the goal of giving antibiotics correctly and treating C. diff correctly isn't so much to reduce costs as it is to treat the patient correctly. So um, getting good outcomes from patients is really what the goal is. But Treating patients appropriately and correctly uh, also does reduce costs. So that's a, a good part of it. So annually in the, the United States, 30% of hospital admissions are due to infection. Two million people develop a hospital-acquired infection. 30 to 50% of hospitalized patients receive antibiotics. And sometimes when we review patients in our hospital, it's, it's upwards of 50 to 60% of patients in the hospital are on antibiotics. And when I first saw that, it really, uh, really surprised me. But uh, the teams will say they feel more comfortable when their patients on antibiotics. Um, so 50% of antibiotic orders unnecessary or, or inappropriate. Uh, that study, that's from uh, something that's about 10 years old now, uh, but it continues to be true. And in nursing homes, it's, it's more like 70% of patients uh, uh, are, the antibiotics given are unnecessary or inappropriate. Antimicrobials are 30% of hospital pharmacy budgets. Uh, so antimicrobials are expensive. So again, healthcare costs and reducing costs isn't the main goal. The main goal is to have a good outcome for the patient, um, as, as it is with stewardship. So stewardship, the goal isn't to stop an 
patients from being on antibiotics. It's to give antibiotics correctly. So here, this was, there are different uh, places that say about how much uh, uh, they estimate the costs are. This is the avoidable costs uh, opportunities from antibiotic misuse. They estimated it at 35 billion, uh, give or take a few billion, but uh, it, it's very expensive. Avoidable costs due to antibiotic misuse. And you can see that the yellow is in the hospital and the blue are prescriptions are out of the hospital. So the majority is, is uh, in the hospital. And then it, it broke down the outpatient uh, 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 antibiotic use and the types of uh, concerns that people have when they give antibiotics. And, oh, here you go. And I was just going to touch base on nursing homes. About 4.1 million patients are admitted in nursing homes yearly, annually at, in the U.S. And about 70% of those patients uh, receive um, a diagnosis of infection and, in, and receive antimicrobials. And in that 70%, 75% of those antibiotics, antimicrobials are unnecessary or maybe mis, um, incorrectly prescribed. So again, 30, um, in the outpatient setting, over 30% of um, antibiotic prescribed is unnecessary. Just uh, to highlight in the red, if we are able to reduce um, antimicrobial prescription by 10% in our community, we could reduce C. difficile infection by about 17%. So, and this slide is from CDC again. Annually, we have about 14,000 um, patients dying from C. diff, and it costs over $1 billion um, in healthcare cost. Um, I like to present this data the, about how our in Nebraska. Um, this is a 2013-14 uh, report for acute care hospitals. So at that time, we were, um, compared to nationally, we were uh, down 30% compared to our prior data. But I think um, in the current data, we are slowly creeping up. So we have a lot of work to do in C. diff in our communities. So I just want to touch base about initially the risk factors for community-associated C. diff infection in adults. Um, this study was recently done um, and published in um, 2017, um, and one of the lead authors was from CDC. Um, so they enrolled about um, in 10 different cities from 2014 to 2015 patients um, who ended up having C. difficile infection. Um, the patients that they enrolled in the studies were over the age of 18. Um, they had positive C. Infection, C. diff infection as an outpatient setting. They were diagnosed with C. diff infection within the first three days of hospitalization and no past history of C. diff. And each patient was matched with a control patient who didn't have C. diff. So overall, in this study, they had about 226 um, case control pair. And most of the patients were females um, over the age of 60, uh, 60 years old. Um, the important thing is most of the patients who had C. difficile infection in the community setting um, had some sort of outpatient contact, about 82%, which was significant compared to the control groups. And antibiotic exposure in the patients who had C. diff infection was about 62% association and versus 10% for the case control um, group. So kind of shows um, healthcare exposure and antimicrobial exposure plays a role. And then they did a multivariate analysis and looked at what kind of risk factors should we keep in mind and can we avoid in the future? So some of the risk factors, um, I highlighted, um, put it in the box, all the antimicrobials. Um, you know, there's some misconception um, in the past, it's like clindamycin, but there's a lot of antimicrobials that causes um, C. difficile infection. Um, cephalosporins, beta-lactam, fluoroquinolones, um, clindamycin, they all had um, uh, close association with uh, causing C. difficile infection. And also some comorbidities played a part as well, chronic um, kidney disease, inflammatory bowel disease, so our patients with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, um, you know, if you received treatment in the emergency department, so those all correlated with high risk of community acquired C. diff infection. Um, another big question we always wonder is why are patients getting recurrent C. diff? So this study was um, nicely done. It was just recently published in American um, Journal of Geriatrics in 2018, um, where they looked at about 616 patients 
with recent history of C. diff, it was, um, and it was around 2014 um, to 15, and then they looked at, um, did any of these patients get recurrent C. diff? And when they looked at all these patients, initial C. diff, and they looked for recurrence, um, the patients who had the recurrent C. diff was in the community, about 24%, and the nursing home patients at even higher percent of recurrent C. diff at 28%. Um, and then they looked at what were the risk factors that caused the recurrence for these patients. So in the community dwelling patients, it was antimicrobial exposure, put them at 1.6% higher, and 2.5% higher if they had acid-reducing agents, especially a proton pump inhibitor. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, and in the nursing home residents, um, the proton pump inhibitor played a huge role in causing recurrent C. diff. There's some, some controversy about this topic, but um, a lot of studies still correlate that does have some association. So, are patients colonized with C. diff? This is an important question to kind of talk about. Um, um, because, uh, you know, when we test for C. diff, what we notice a lot is um, if a patient has one diarrhea, they get tested for C. diff. Um, they might be on laxatives and they're having diarrhea due to that and they're getting tested for C. diff. Um, you know, there's a lot of times patients are getting tested for C. diffs to make sure test of cure. Um, so what should we think, are people, patients really colonized? So several studies since 1981 to 2017 Various numbers, but they range from like zero to 17% show that patients are colonized with C. difficile um, strains. Um, toxigenic strains, about one to 5%. And prevalence of asymptomatic colonization, relatively low in healthy adults. But it's kind of um, interesting when you look at elderly patients, especially if they have nursing home exposure, long-term care facility, multiple studies from 1988 to 2012 shows that it can range anywhere between zero to 50%. So a lot of patients can be colonized with C. diff. So it's really important to know that because um, I think we should be only testing patients when they have clinical signs and symptoms of infection um, uh, so that we don't overtreat patients. Um, I really like this picture um, from this uh, study where they talk about, if you look at the first um, row, um, good cells, patient get exposed to a C. difficile spore. We have really good gastric acid, which kind of keeps it under control so that the C. difficile spores don't germinate, don't multiply. When they enter the colon, you have um, our good bacteria kind of keeps them under control. We have bile acid, resins, so, um, and um, a lot of other factors keeping them under control, so they're just staying colonized. How do you go from colonization to these patients becoming infected? Um, in, when you're in healthcare settings, um, when you don't, in oral ingestion through food, not cleaning your hands, when you're using PPIs, your gastric acid pH goes down, the C. diff spore starts germinating, nicely goes into your colon. So now, if you have risk factors like older age, especially page, patients over the age of 65, um, if you have lots of antibiotics, now you killed off all your good bacteria, um, the pathogen, pathogen starts expanding and now you have a C. difficile infection with diarrhea. So this is kind of a nice illustration of that. So pediatric patients. Um, I get a lot of questions about should we be testing our pediatric patients for C. diff? And it's really um, important to know a lot of pediatric patients are colonized with C. difficile um, uh, bacteria. So for the first four weeks of life, Colonization increases from zero to 37%, but they do not have symptomatic infection. For the first one year of life, average children have about 10% colonization, but they do not have symptomatic infection. So we should be very careful in um, checking for, especially kids less than one year of age for C. difficile infection. I was just talking to a pediatric infectious disease doctor, Andrea Green, and she um, was saying the same thing. Less than one year of age, um, we shouldn't be testing children for C. difficile infection. But if we are worried about C. difficile infection in a child, I think it's really important to reach out to the experts, infectious disease, um, pediatric infectious disease staff to get some guidance on that. <laughs> 
um, proton pump inhibitors. Do we really need those? So um, in one of our hospitals, um, uh, and CHI held uh, one of our hospitals, they did a study where they looked at um, can we reduce the infection with in, um, limiting the proton pump inhibitor usage. So everybody um, uh, that was put on proton pump inhibitor got reviewed and made sure it got discontinued on discharge and they were able to significantly reduce the C. diff rate at their hospital. Um, so a lot of studies since 2004 to 2012 um, is showing that proton pump inhibitors do play a role in C. difficile infection. Normal gastric acid is a protective mechanism for us. Um, so I think it's really important when we have patients in um, hospital setting, nursing facilities, long care facilities. A lot of times patient gets put on the, um, a proton pump inhibitor in the ICU because they want stress or steroids. But then that never gets discontinued. And on pay, when patient gets discharged, then our patient goes to the long-term care facility to home with the proton pump inhibitor. But they really don't need the medication. So I think um, reviewing proton pump inhibitor and the need for that is extremely important. Um, so there's a lot of um, questions about do antimicrobial stewardship help prevent C. diff? There have been a lot of studies, but they just um, published a study in 2017, really nicely done. It was a meta-analysis where they looked at over 32 studies, had over 9 million patient days, and um, the results were that having antimicrobial stewardship does help reduce gram-negative bacteria, resistant gram-negative bacteria by 51%, staph aureus infection by 37%, but what I want to highlight is C. difficile infection by 32%. So antimicrobial stewardship does help in reducing C. difficile infection, but it's not the only thing. I think we need to, we'll get into that a little bit later, but it does help. So this was a really nice study that was published in Lancet. So we want to kind of talk about the new guidelines. So I'm going to let Dr. Horn pick that up. <clears throat> so we wanted to kind of go through the, the new guidelines a little bit. These are brand new. Um, and I'd like to just mention where you can find these. So this is the uh, IDSA website, the Infectious Disease Society of America website. So if you just go to Google and you type in IDSA C. diff guidelines, it should pop up. Uh, and these are uh, very new. So we want to just go through some of the recommendations. Uh, the first slide here is on, on testing and interpretation of the testing. So I do like to highlight this slide. It's from U, uh, Nebraska Med. It was nicely put. So. so this is actually not from the guidelines. This is from Nebraska Medicine website, the antimicrobial stewardship uh, website in Nebraska Medicine. And they have a lot of great uh, information about antimicrobial stewardship. And this, I think, is actually better than what the guidelines have as far as, uh, as, far as algorithms and, and testing goes. But it, it reflects the guidelines. And so you can start here on the left, the antigen. Uh, uh, and toxin tests. So it's important to test correctly because, as Dr. V was saying, you can have colonization and you can have infection. And trying to tell the two apart uh, can sometimes be uh, uh, kind, kind of challenging. So um, it's important to do this, this type of testing to see um, if, if you think that they do have a, a C. diff infection. So people can be colonized with uh, uh, C. diff. They can be colonized with C. diff with, uh, with or without the, the toxin uh, uh, production, toxin producing strains. And they can also be colonized with the, the toxin producing strains and not have an infection at the time. So we'll start here on the left. It says antigen positive and, and toxin positive. So if they're antigen positive and toxin positive, you'd say C. diff is, is present. Um, and I, I would like to uh, also emphasize that they should be having three loose stools within a 24 hour period and not beyond. Uh, on laxatives at the time. And if they are on laxatives, at least wait 48 hours before we test for a C. diff infection. Um, because if you're colonized with C. diff, now you have laxatives, so you're going to have watery stools and the test is going to come back positive. Right. And, and with the new, the new push to show uh, community-acquired C. diff versus hospital-acquired C. diff, uh, and giving nurses um, the ability to test for C. diff, sometimes they want to test early and quickly, so they might come in and they there's kind of this uh, uh, urge to test as quick as you can to not show that it's a hospital-acquired infection. So um, 
but it's important that, that the stool be uh, not formed, so it takes the shape of the container. And C diff, so if it's antigen positive, toxin positive, you'd say C diff is present. If it's antigen positive but toxin negative, then you would use PCR to differentiate. And if the, the PCR is positive, then you'd say C. diff may be present, but if they're stooling a lot and you're already suspecting it, you'd say that they have C. diff uh, present and treat them for C. diff. And then if the PCR test is negative, you'd say C. diff, uh, C. diff infection is not present. And the, the PCR test is, is testing for C. diff with the toxin producing uh, uh, gene. Antigen negative and toxin negative, then you would say that they do not have C. diff. Treatment recommendations for all patients with C. diff. So if they have C. diff, you want to replace fluids and electrolytes because they're losing a lot of fluids and electrolytes through diarrhea. Discontinue acid suppressive medications, so their uh, PPIs, you'd want to discontinue if you can. A lot of them get started while they're in the hospital and then they just never, never stop taking them. Discontinue concomitant antibiotics if possible. Um, so if the patient's on antibiotics for an infection like a, uh, an osteomyelitis or an endocarditis where you can't stop treatment, where you need to continue antibiotics, and then they come down with C. diff, you can continue the antibiotics for their osteomyelitis or their endocarditis, but you'd want to narrow the antibiotics as much as you can, uh, so you're not putting pressure on the gut. Um, and then you'd also want to treat C. diff along with it. So you'd treat C. diff at the same time uh, you're giving antibiotics, and sometimes you, you don't really have a choice. So you can treat it at the same time, and uh, what I prefer to do is treat, treat the C. diff uh, while you're giving antibiotics for their other infection, and then I'll extend it out a little bit longer. Uh, this isn't all in the new guidelines, but these are things I think people do anyway. Uh, the other thing that people do is would be if someone's had recurrent C. diff, um, and they've had C. diff multiple times, and then now they need to be on another antibiotic, the guidelines wouldn't say to start C. diff treatment with the new antibiotics, but sometimes that's done. Uh, and it's done for fear that they may develop C. diff uh, uh, with this new round of antibiotics if if they've been getting C. diff uh, recurrence. Uh, and again, that's not all in the guidelines, but it's, it, they're things that people uh, do. For example, like let's say there was a patient two weeks ago just finished therapy and now they're back in again and they're getting broad spectrum antibiotic and they just finished treatment for C. diff. We're really af fearful that they're gonna get C. diff again. So most of the time we put them on oral vanco to make sure. It's not on the guidelines, but some, some of the ID docs uh, we do that. And then the last one here is monitor for clinical worsening and adjust therapy as needed. So once you've diagnosed them with C. diff, you want to follow clinically how they're doing. So are they continuing to have diarrhea or not? And the question often comes up, when do you retest for C. diff to make sure it's gone? So we don't recommend retesting for C. diff to make sure it's gone. You go off of symptoms. So uh, let's see, we'll get to potential treatments. So here's um, potential treatments. There's vancomycin, fodaxomycin, um, and then it includes metronidazole. This is also to show the costs. So vancomycin um, uh, by pills, by pill form, is expensive. It's cheaper if you give the liquid form. Uh, sometimes providers don't know that, and we'll talk with them, and they'll say vancomycin is so expensive, and, and they won't know about the liquid formulation. So the liquid formulation is cheaper, and fodaxomycin is also, uh, fodaxomycin is expensive. When they were making the guidelines, uh, they said that they didn't really take cost into consideration when they were uh, recommending which ones to give, uh, but fodaxomycin uh, uh, is very expensive. And metronidazole is there as well, although metronidazole really isn't recommended for C. diff anymore. And here's, this is just from another paper showing um, uh, some, some of the costs of C. diff treatment. So vancomycin liquid compared to vancomycin capsules and, and the difference in cost and, and fodaxomycin. And I think this was in uh, Minnesota and it, just highlights how expensive it is to treat, and, and uh, uh, but it will vary in different areas. And here's seed of treatment, initial episode. So the initial episode, non-severe, and then it has initial episode severe. And so this is important. I'd like to highlight the difference between uh, non-severe and severe. So if they have non-severe, they should be having a, a white count less than 15 and a serum creatinine uh, less than 1.5. So uh, if they've been having a lot of diarrhea, getting uh, very dehydrated, um, that's um, one of the reasons we follow the creatinine. The, the severe, uh, they need either a white count greater than 15 or a serum creatinine greater than 1.5. That's a change from the, the previous uh, uh, guidelines as far as creatinine level greater than or equal to 1.5, and you're not really taking into consideration their, their pre-existing creatinine. Uh, 
And as far as uh, the treatment, recommended treatment is vancomycin, 125 milligrams four times a day for 10 days. Or fidaxomycin, uh, you can do either one. Um, but the alternative would be metronidazole if you don't have fidaxomycin or vancomycin. So uh, those are the drugs of choice. And then initial episode severe is also vancomycin 125 four times a day or fidaxomycin. So the treatment is the same except when you get into the last category here, initial episode fulminant. So if they're having hypotension or shock or ileus or megacolon, um, you'd want to recognize that and you'd want to put them on 500 milligrams four times a day of vancomycin. And if they have an ileus and the vancomycin can't get there, because the vancomycin uh, stays in the GI tract, it doesn't get into the uh, blood, you don't get good blood levels. So if it can't get there because they have an ileus, you'd want to give it um, uh, rectally. So you'd want to give uh, vancomycin enemas to try and get it to the colon, get it where it needs to be. And then also give uh, metronidazole IV. So you'd give metronidazole IV in this situation um, if they're having an ileus and uh, you're trying to do everything you can for them. And risk factors for, for reoccurrence. So when someone comes in and they, they say, uh, I had C. diff and now I'm having diarrhea again, it's important to kind of differentiate did they have C. diff and you started treatment for them and they improved and they did better and then they uh, stopped treatment and then had it reoccur? So that would be a recurrence. Or if they had diarrhea, you put them on treatment and they never had any changes. So they'd say that the, um, it's not working essentially. So it, they never improved and it didn't reoccur. It just hasn't gotten better the whole time. So advanced age greater than 65 years old, concurrent antibiotic use, prior infections with, with uh, epidemic strains. Effective immune response, underlying comorbidities, uh, con uh, and then PPIs. So what do you do for reoccurrence? So this is also from the guidelines for the first reoccurrence. Uh, so if they got metronidazole the first time, then you'd want to use vancomycin. Uh, but if they had vancomycin the first time, then you'd, you'd use a prolonged taper. So uh, you essentially give them a lot of vancomycin and uh, uh, watch their symptoms. So if their symptoms, if you're starting your taper, and you're starting to taper down, and then their symptoms, their, in, their diarrhea increases, and they start having uh, uh, more diarrhea episodes per day, uh, and they say they're getting worse, then you'd want to increase uh, and essentially just go back up on the taper and, and give more PO vancomycin. Uh, uh, the second or subsequent reoccurrence, so they recommend vancomycin, uh, a tapered regimen, and then you, you actually have to have multiple reoccurrences before they start discussing uh, fecal, uh, fecal transplants. So, um, And the thing about fecal transplant, um, it has good outcomes and it used to be that you had to get donated from a family member, but now you have frozen stool, um, not advocating for the company Open Biome, but um, they, uh, we, a lot of hospitals use uh, Open Biome to get frozen stool and then you could use that to um, you know, help with a fecal transplant as well. Um, so that option is there as well, because when you had to do a fecal transplant from a family member, sometimes it took a while, you had to do all the screening tests, HIV, hepatitis, it was a lot of cost. So now there's another option when we need it fast, there's another option to use the frozen stool option as well. Right, I, I think they're, um, so instead of donating blood, people will donate their stool. Um, so what is the role of antibiotic stewardship in controlling C. diff rates? So minimize the frequency and duration of high risk antibiotics as much as possible, and then implement an antibiotic stewardship program. So these are, are good recommendations. Uh, when should isolation be implemented? So patients suspected of C. diff infection should be placed on preemptive uh, contact precautions. So if the test is ordered, then the, the patient should be put into uh, uh, contact precautions, gloves and gowns. So you're not waiting for it to become positive and then say, oh, we should have had them in, in precautions uh, all this time. And, and this, is <clears throat> this is a good diagram. It says overview of, of C. diff transmission. So on the left, you start with exposure. Two thirds goes to asymptomatic carriers and one third goes to C. diff infection uh, patient. And then from the C. diff infection patient, the spores can get onto the skin, the clothing, the bedding, uh, the environment on to another patient's hands and, that, and, and get into the susceptible patients. So it's important also, again, even if you don't touch the patient, you can, uh, people will say, oh, I'm not gonna wash my hands because I'm, I'm not gonna touch the patient. They go into the patient room, 
and, and just touching things in the room, they can get it uh, on their hands and their clothing. So uh, good hand washing is, uh, can't really be stressed enough. And this is control of an outbreak of infection with hypervirulent C. diff strain. Uh, and this is a bundle approach. This was done in Pittsburgh. And they used a bundle, which means they did multiple things all at one time. So it's hard to say one thing made the difference, but as a bundle, uh, uh, this is what they did that made a big difference. So they stressed education, standardized education both for providers and patients, increase uh, in early case findings, so identifying patients early to stop, stop the transmission, and they, primary care nurses were granted authority to order testing. So when more people are ordering testing, then uh, there's more possibility of having false positives, but they're trying to identify patients early uh, and stress which patients to test to, to try and get it under control. Uh, expanded infection control measures, so environmental cleaning, uh, uh, Im improvements, development of C. diff management team. So the C. diff management team comprised of ID clinicians. They would review patients' charts, identify the patients, and, and try to make interventions. So it's almost like a prospective audit with feedback. It's a real-time review, trying to get patients on the right, uh, right treatment, right management. Antimicrobial uh, management, so prior approval for, for ID physicians and pharmacists for clindamycin, ceftriaxone, levofloxacin, um, so high-risk C. diff drugs, so, so getting uh, uh, prior approval. And during this period, uh, they had 78% uh, overall reduction. Uh, so this bundle really, uh, uh, really worked, and so it, it really uh, made a big difference doing all of these things together. And this is what was done uh, uh, at CHI. So. Yeah, so we started a robust C um, antimicrobial stewardship um, last um, July. And one of our goals was to make sure all the patients get treated with, um, for C. difficile infection. So uh, with the antimicrobial stewardship pharmacist and myself, we review every single patient that gets C. diff in our hospital, make sure they're on the right therapy, work with infection control, and, um, you know, our SIR rates, infection rates have gone down, but a secondary benefit, what we just found out recently, is that our readmission rates to C. diffs have gone down as well. Uh, overall, for our system, uh, it's gone down 3.4%. For our academic medical center, it has gone down 11% by making sure we concentrate on every single patient we review. And our complication rate for these patients have gone down about 4.4%. So um, another benefit of antimicrobial stewardship is not just prescribing the antimicrobials correctly, but secondary outcomes like readmission has an impact as well. So this is also from the guidelines. Should gown and gloves be worn while, while caring for isolated C. diff patients? And, um, healthcare personnel must use <laughs> uh, gloves uh, and, and gowns uh, when, when caring for the patient uh, and going into their room. How long should isolation be continued? So continue contact precautions for at least 48 hours after diarrhea has resolved. And prolong contact precautions until discharge uh, is see if infection rates remain high despite implementation uh, of standard infection control measures. So the person should uh, be in isolation and then their di until their diarrhea is essentially controlled. And then before taking them out of precautions, you should also clean the room. So if you took them out of precautions but kept them in the same room, you still have the C. diff all over the room. Uh, so how should the room be cleaned? And that's what this, this was, study was talking about. This study just highlights that, um, if you want to go to the next slide, okay. uh, it just highlights that all the hospital rooms, they looked at over 27 rooms, high touch surfaces, they have lots of bacteria, MRSA, C. diff. But what was important is that manual cleaning, every single bacteria, load went down in each of the rooms when they did terminal cleaning of the room with uh, uh, sporicidal agents, which had a significant impact in the C. difficile in the room, um, floral, high touch surfaces. So takeaway point is that, you know, C. diff spores last in the hospital rooms weeks later. And there was a study that showing two weeks later, a patient can get C. diff from the initial patient that was there before. So I think cleaning, working with the environmental staff and cleaning our rooms is extremely important. And then this is from the guidelines again. It says, uh, what is the role of probiotics in primary prevention of, of C. diff infections? And it said there is insufficient data at this time to recommend administration of probiotics for primary prevention. And this is a question we get a lot also. So uh, not only from providers saying, you know, 
what probiotics would you recommend, but also from the patients saying, I'd like to take a probiotic, um, uh, what do you recommend? And so far, uh, there have been some large uh, reviews about probiotics, and some of them, it, it, it looks like there's an improvement, but it's, it's not statistically significant, and then others, it just uh, doesn't really pan out. So uh, what I tell patients is that if you want to take a probiotic, um, <laughs> Uh, that, that's fine. It might help and it won't hurt, is generally what I say. So if you'd like to take it, you know, there, there, we don't have that much for C. diff, really. Um, so the options are kind of limited, and if they want to take a probiotic, uh, I'm fine with it. I think that's, uh, and then I think that's about what you say. Yeah. This, so I was at Whole Foods, and they have a whole aisle now of, on probiotics, and it says gut shots. <laughs> and if you can see, there's, there's a lot of sediment. <laughs> in the, uh, uh, and, and this, there's a, this is a small aisle at, at Whole Foods, and the guy at Whole Foods said, oh, in California, it's, it's a huge aisle. I guess uh, it's, they have a lot of different things. And you can see in the nutritional facts at the bottom, it says, well, 110 billion colony-forming colony units of, and it names some of the bacteria that they put in there. Um, so this is an option, I guess, if you want to take a probiotic. <laughs> so, and they have multiple different uh, uh, bottles by the same company with different, uh, different strains and different things in it. So I, this was at Whole Foods. I kind of found it interesting. And then to summarize, first, first line agent for C. diff is, is oral vancomycin. So we're no longer using metronidazole. Antibiotic stewardship can reduce C. diff, uh, C. diff infections. So uh, antibiotic stewardship does help. To reduce C. diff infections, we need a bundle approach. So that, that's been shown to be effective. So good hand hygiene, good isolation practices, early decision and treatment, or early detection and treatment, environmental cleaning and, and education essentially for everybody. Okay, thank you very much. Thank and you. If there are any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Mm -hmm.